hey, normally this is the part where I'd play the thing saying, you know, give me money, give me money, give me money. But instead, for the next little while, there's going to be some charities down in the description for some really important stuff. Uh, give them money instead. Okay, thank you. On with the show. Alright, you don't need a primer, you know how this works. Top 5 best, worst, and blandest Disney films is how we're closing off the Disney project, so let's go! You're back on your feet. Good. I still can't get it out of my head. Treasure Planet is a beautifully creative film with some of the most fuck you imagination I've ever seen out of a film. It's like something a child would make, and honestly, more films should look like that. Some of the most enjoyable characters ever seen, and one just kinda okay character, make for a lovely and enjoyable cast. That's the magic of it. There's nobody here who's objectionable. The worst character in the film is just kind of okay. There's nothing to be mad or disappointed about. It's a film that says, hey, let's have a few character building months in space. And then we did. <laughs> Well, this is inconvenient. Just whistle while you work, and maybe in an hour this'll suddenly be good. I was gonna chalk this down to just the early films being early, but even Pinocchio had more of a story to it. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs feels more like a tech demo than an actual film. Fun fact, actually, did you know Snow White's blush is somebody's actual makeup that they put on the frame? Did you also know that that's the single most useless piece of film trivia ever? This movie's fucking boring. If you run now, you may live. It's funny how some people act like Gurgi is the worst thing in the movie when honestly the main character whose name I've forgotten couldn't be bothered looking up again is a lot more annoying than he could ever be. The thing is, the Black Cauldron was long the black sheep of Disney's output, and it wasn't until the 2000s and 2010s that it started gathering a cult following of the kind of people who were responsible for all the garbage the 2010s gave us. A darker fantasy story where all the characters are terrible, the story makes no sense, and the only likable character is the comic relief. Who looks at that and goes, sign me the fuck up? An acceptable first effort. I'm gonna get a lot of shit for putting this on the list and not Zootopia, but honestly, I just had more fun with it. I didn't have to draft in one of my funniest friends just to get the video done in a reasonable time. As much as I grouse about the twist mongering in the film, at the end of the day, the twist is largely in service to the characters. It's less a big secret being revealed and more just a very clumsy attempt to play on the audience's expectations. It is still a relatively straightforward adventure about two estranged sisters trying to patch things up between them and maybe not kill the entire kingdom. This isn't like Sylvanas was actually evil all along, because that relied on retconning previous information about the character and just pretending half of the story didn't exist. The twist is largely harmless to the story, its biggest crime is just being insufferably pleased with itself. Also, as much as I complained about it, I love how weird this movie is. I kinda don't want Jennifer Lee to get better at writing dialogue because shit like this is fucking hilarious. It's one of those movies I would gladly go back and watch again because it's just fucking fun. I was originally going to put Tangled here, but after the roundup went up I was informed that Mother Gothel is actually, like, a really, really anti-Semitic caricature. There's gonna be a post link below, I mean, unless I forgot to link it, in which case somebody slap future me and tell me to get on that. And trust me, it's very enlightening. Like, yeesh. What have you dragged along with you? King Arthur goes to school, and then he pulls the sword out, and these two things are not related to each other at all. It's called the Sword of the Stone, and you're just waiting for the Sword of the Stone to actually be a thing. Maybe monarchy should have contingency plans for when the king's bloodline goes extinct beyond just whoever lifts the most. How dare you! I could sit here and detail why Peter Pan is awful, but come on, you fucking know. It's the racism. It was a toss-up between this or Aristocrats, and Aristocrats was one song and then over, and this was just half the fucking movie. Jesus Christ. Splendid. Victims of abuse do not need to change. They just fucking don't. I don't care what you think you can suss out in your pop feminist hot takes, if they don't acknowledge the abusive behaviors of King Triton and Lady Tremaine, then you need to shut your fucking mouth. You're just under JK Rowling on a slow day with an entire marketing department begging her to stop tweeting on the garbage humans nobody should listen to list. If you think these films are about sitting around, being pretty, and waiting for a man, you have missed not only the horrendous abuse being done to these characters, but also the fact that they don't wait around, they're extremely proactive. They wanted a piece of that for some reason, and they went after it. I could slot them right alongside Sylvanas, in terms of, I don't understand your taste in men, but if it makes you happy, go and fucking get it. And that's two Sylvanas comparisons. One more and I meet my quota. <laughs> this does not concern you. How do you ruin a good movie? By making a sequel with a promising story and then fucking off from that story to chase the fan theories about Elsa's powers that didn't need explaining. Couple that with clashing art design, some very uncanny valley looking character models, and some pandering of the worst degree, and you have Frozen 2. A great big fucking... Hang on, what was I talking about? Ah, there you are! 
I'd originally criticized Princess and the Frog for glossing over the era it so foolishly chose to set itself in, but that idea fell by the wayside after talking to Carousel Unique, who pointed out that the film presents more of it than one would, it's just that it was more demonstrated than talked about. Which is why a little woman of your background would have had a hands full trying to run a big business like that. So fair enough, that's on me for being oblivious. Thankfully, the film is still overly dense and complicated, astonishingly sexist for 2009, and with an attitude about love that sounds way too much like a certain Christo Pagan that I used to know. So that means I didn't have to reorganize this damn list at the last second. Yay! <laughs> Look who joins the fray. Good. I was hoping you'd keep this interesting. I stand by what I said in the final roundup. This is probably one of the best films Disney's ever made because it takes a simple concept, expands on it for the sake of making it more fun, and is such a delightful laugh riot from start to finish that it actually made me melancholy about the state of modern animation where sheer joy like this is so routinely frowned upon. It made me so happy that I circled around to being depressed again. It's a magical experience. A lovely movie, and you should definitely watch it or I'll appear in your room tonight staring at you and slowly sharpening a knife. Is this anyone's favorite film? Like, I'm genuinely curious. As I'm sure you'd agree, there's nothing like a little desecration to demoralize an enemy. It was the fact that nobody defends this film that kept it from the number one spot, and frankly, I don't need to repeat myself from the roundup. It whitewashes history to an absurd fucking degree, and unlike Hamilton, doesn't have some mediocre earworms to give white liberals an excuse to even try to defend this one. That having been said, the fact that the movie makes token acknowledgments to the actual history does mean it's fucking hilarious to watch this film try to have its cake and fuck it too. I would suggest you watch it, if for no other reason than to laugh at the audacity. This one will make a useful ally. It was a toss-up between this and a twist in time, but while a twist in time is certainly a fun laugh riot with a few emotional moments that get you in the good way, Moana is a fun laugh riot with even more emotional moments that get you in the good way. I do like a little bit of sad in my happy juice. Moana has some of my favorite characters, my favorite moments, and it's such a beautiful movie that I could go back and watch over and over and over again. Every film has those moments that you kind of just want to get past, you know, the ones that might make you hesitate to put it back on, but Moana has none of those. It's 100% enjoyment, some really good characters who I want to see succeed, and some heavy emotional moments that hit you in the really, really, really good way. It's the full package as movies go, where most movies try to be all sads or all laughs, and that's valid. Moana asks the brave question, hey, why don't we have both once in a while? No, no, I suppose that won't do. Okay, I'll level with you. I didn't finish the Jungle Book. I got 20 minutes into the movie and I only had like three jokes written and decided that I couldn't be bothered finishing it. I don't know what it was that made me so criminally bored, but I just couldn't stand watching another minute. And you probably noticed that I just copied what I said in the roundup verbatim, because this movie is too boring to put in the effort, and the only thing that has going for it is being the last film Walt Disney himself actually made. Man, talk about ending your career with a dud. Which You shall pay dearly for that. This movie's a lot easier to criticize ever since Rise of Skywalker came out. Really, any toxic love story is easier to criticize ever since Rise of Skywalker came out. I wonder if there's still people who are going to argue that learning a few basic manners makes the forced imprisonment okay. Slavery's fine as long as your master is polite about it, I guess. Oh, but Lily, she made a deal, so she's not a prisoner. Ooh, actually... I release you. You're no longer my prisoner. This is a movie that acts like your abuser apologizing for hitting you somehow means the abuse didn't happen, or if an environment of constant fear and intimidation can be fixed if you just lean in a little. The fact that this movie was a modern classic when I was a kid makes me look at the overfixation on half-assed villain redemptions and slapdash enemies to lovers and wonder just how badly this film fucked with people's heads. But the fact of the matter is that nobody defends Pocahontas. Nobody will argue that it's a genuinely good movie, not even to be contrarian and for the hell of it. It's a universally reviled movie. But people still passionately defend Beauty and the Beast as a timeless classic, and a love story for the ages. That is not okay. This shit was horrible back in the 90s when they did it with abusive boyfriends. It's still horrible today when it's being done with abusive parents. Can we just stop doing this? Can we stop writing sympathetic sob stories for abusers and stop writing stories that villainize abuse victims? Oh, there's my quota, Matt. Boy, do I feel productive. <laughs>